HTTP must die. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Parker, and this is Jan. Uh, <laughs> we work at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I'm an activist there, and she's a technologist. Uh, and today, we're going to be talking about uh, HTTPS and web encryption and uh, the, the many shortcomings of unencrypted web protocols. Um, so uh, thank you for coming. And uh, I, if I did, could just quickly, does, do people here know um, what the Electronic Frontier Foundation is? Where you work? Woo! Great. We can't actually see you, so it's OK. I don't to, raise yeah. your hands. <laughs> I, uh, so yeah, EFF, we do a lot of things around um, preserving people's privacy and uh, anonymity online. And so uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the things that we do in law and in activism and in code uh, to make people's online and technical experience uh, a little more private. All right, uh, so how many people here have ever felt insecure? Because you're lonely, you lost your job, you're not happy with yourself for some reason. Um, so, I've never actually felt any of those things, but the other day, I was visiting Quora, Quora.com, which many people visit, um, and I noticed they're serving their login page over plain HTTP, and that's bad, because even if you're sending things over HTTPS, the attacker can modify the form and then uh, change the target to whatever they want. So in their case, it was even worse because they were actually just sending usernames and passwords in plain HTTP. Shame on them. Um, and by the way, it's 2014. <laughs> this one out of fashion in like 2001. <laughs> and they're asking me to use Flash. You right. Uh, so I mean, um, you guys aren't hope. I'm pretty sure most people here know why HTTP sucks. But to go over it again, there's no data confidentiality, so the person at the coffee shop or the person sitting next to you right now can read what you're sending over the wire. Uh, no data integrity, so they can tamper with it and you can't detect anything. Uh, and there's no server authentication, so if you're visiting httpcora.com, it could be anything. Um, so could given be all Quora. of this, what? Could be Quora. Could even be Quora, oh my gosh. Uh, so given all of this, why are we still using HTTP? Okay, so people say HTTPS is hard. It's not actually true, but people might say certificate authorities are gross. Uh, they kill elephants. They are people we don't trust. Um, they can be corrupted by governments that say issue a certificate for something. Um, and we've seen evidence of this in the wild. So that's a real concern. Certificate authorities suck a lot. Uh, mixed content is bad, so if you're a news site and you're, you know, you've switched over to HTTPS, you're probably serving ads that don't support HTTPS. So you have to support HTTP, and then you have HTTP JavaScript on an HTTPS page, and then it's not, you know, not no security guarantees anymore. Um, many advertisers don't yet support HTTPS, and that's why news organizations have been slow to transition to HTTPS by default. And if you're using a CDN, sometimes Alchemy, for instance, they can charge extra for HTTPS because they say, oh, you know, um, Windows XP doesn't support SNI, and so we need extra IP addresses, and so forth. And so because, and you, you know, if you have set up HTTPS, you have to remember to renew a search. So I recently saw a statistic that something like, uh, like 40% of SSL certs in the wild were set to expire within a few months. Um, great. Let's go on. So uh, let's start the talk with, uh, with part one. Why are we interested in HTTPS? Why do we start there? And I think the obvious answer is because we know they are interested in HTTP. Um, this slide uh, was, is, a, is a, a Snowden slide. Of course, uh, it's been in vogue for a year now to have slides that contain images of slides. And uh, we will not break from that trend. Uh, we know that the, that the NSA is interested in HTTP because they said that. Um, HTTP, uh, it touches you know, almost everything that users do. And, and, uh, and we saw this in the X key score leak. And more, uh, more particularly, we saw that they drill down to, uh, to search terms and news sites and 
uh, here, here Glenn is quoted as saying, as one slide indicates, the ability to search HTTP activity by keyword permits the analyst access to what the NSA calls nearly everything a typical user does on the internet. So this matters a lot. Um, and it's important to note that HTTPS uh, and the commitment to HTTPS doesn't stop at the uh, lock on the user's browser. Um, you have to be encrypting the, the whole way. This, of course, is, uh, is from the, the muscular leak. Uh, I think most people will have seen the, the evil smiley by SSL added and removed here. Um, and that comes from a failure to be using uh, HTTPS or encryption uh, along the whole path, in this case between data centers. And when you've got an agency with a footprint as large as the NSA, that, that actually matters. Great. Uh, so how many of you have seen this article from The Intercept? So I know Michael Lee, oh, quite a few. I can't really see anything, but I um, can kind of see some hands. So Michael Lee, who's in the audience, actually works on The Intercept, and I'm sure. I uh, can tell you all about it. But anyway, so they published this really this article that was really shocking to us uh, a few months ago that says NSA has the server set up to implant, uh, potentially implant millions of devices with malware. That's pretty scary, and that's a lot of devices. So how does HTTP traffic enable this? Um, so here is a slide within a slide <laughs> from the NSA's quantum program. Um, so what you see here is a diagram of the target, which could be, you know, me or you or Parker or anyone here, logging into their Yahoo Mail account because maybe it's like 2008 uh, and you were still using Yahoo Mail. Um, and uh, so they log in and Yahoo Mail, maybe at that time, isn't HTTPS by default, even though it does a 302 redirect or something. Um, so um, the NSA server or, um, yeah, the NSA server can see that they're going to Yahoo. Um, and they, uh, this sends a signal to what's called a Fox Asset server. And the Fox Asset server does the work of sending back malicious packets to the user's devices, uh, f for, uh, like spoofed to look like Yahoo packets. Um, so in essence, um, by putting these, uh, these like packet ejection servers at um, strategic geographic locations, um, they can exploit this race condition and get to the target's computer before the real Yahoo packets. Um, and this uh, this uh, packet injection will like exploit some sort of vulnerability in browsers and um, and implant the malware. And this is quite scary. So you might be asking, so uh, millions of computers, you know, maybe they're doing sort of targeting, you know, like targeting people that they think are suspicious. So what would they be using for targeting? And it turns out they're using things like cookies, like Google cookies, Yahoo cookies, et cetera. Um, because many services like Google, even if they're using HTTPS by default, uh, they're leaking your identity all over uh, because they have not secured cookies. So um, if you don't set the secure flag on a cookie, as many of you know, um, another, uh, another, a man in the middle can say, I am Google.com, send me all the cookies for Google.com and they'll read all your Google cookies, which are really unique, and they can even set cookies for you. They can say, um, set this cookie for this uh, target so I can look at them later. So cookies are being used as selectors, in this case, plain HTTP cookies. Um, we also, uh, they also use some browser selector. We don't know what code name Silly Bunny is, but we've chosen to illustrate it with a Silly yeah, Bunny. Yeah, so we asked, we asked some lawyers, and like no one knew what Silly Bunny was. If anyone knows what Silly Bunny is, please tell us. Uh, we'd really like to know. <laughs> right, so, so, let's, so let's reiterate that. So unencrypted cookies, we used to think cookies are bad because advertisers use them to track us around the web. Now we know they're also bad because they're used as weapons for NSA to decide who to target with malware. Um, so we, we know that there's a, uh, a privacy reason and a security reason, but there's also another really important reason to be using uh, HTTPS, and it's maybe one that doesn't get as much attention, and it has to do with censorship. So when we talk about something like the, the Great Firewall of China, there's a number of ways in which it works, but one of the ways it works is by doing uh, keyword filtering, by uh, drilling down on the contents of a particular web page or of a page within a site. So, you know, you can access a newspaper, but not necessarily the offending article. Um, 
And the way that HTTPS addresses this is that uh, when you uh, when you make an HTTPS connection, only the host is uh, is is available in the in the clear. Um, so if you're looking at an article, for example, on the Intercept here, uh, a, a man in the middle can know that you're looking at something on First Look, uh, but they don't necessarily know which uh, which part of First Look or even which which article. And there's a there's a big asterisk next to that. So this is this is true for uh, for all sorts of sites. A, a big example is Wikipedia, of course. Uh, it means something different to be looking at Wikipedia than to be looking at an article on you know, something in particular uh, or inflammatory. But the big asterisk there is that that uh, is still vulnerable to uh, things like metadata analysis. So if each article has a distinct file size, uh, then you can you can get around this by just measuring the size of the files that are being transferred and you can know which article people are looking at. Um, there are ways of avoiding that. You can do padding, um, but that has pros and cons. Uh, the important part here is that this kind of uh, the HTTPS makes that kind of attack much more sophisticated and expensive. And so, even if it's not perfect, uh, it, it does a good job of of um, protecting privacy. But the censorship angle here is that. Uh, it forces somebody who wants to block certain keywords to make the decision to block an entire site or not. And we've actually seen this play out. So uh, last year, GitHub was, for a little while, blocked in China. The entirety of GitHub, because it's HTTPS, was blocked because there were um, the, the, the leading belief is that there were a handful of repositories that had something offensive. And so the, the only solution, because you can't block those repositories, is to block the in, entire site. And of course, the Chinese developer community was not very happy about this, and they were very vocal, and they said uh, that, that that you know we can't do our work, and so uh, there was a backlash, and that backlash forced uh, forced the, the hands of the Chinese censors to say, okay, we'll, we'll let the whole thing go, including uh, including these repositories we don't like. And there's a there's a quote from a prominent Chinese developer who said he compared the blocking of GitHub to trying to catch a mouse by burning the entire house down. Forcing that decision is a good position to be in, to, to release the mice into the house and say, well, your only option is to burn the whole house down. And that, that puts the blame really squarely where it belongs on the censors. So that's, uh, that's a, a, an important story with a, with a good conclusion. Um, there's one that didn't end as well, uh, which, is, uh, which is the story of Google Reader. Uh, similarly, Google Reader was, was at a you know, path. It wasn't a subdomain. So it was google.com slash reader. And so countries had to choose whether they were going to block all of Google services or allow Reader. And of course, Reader could make connections to other sites. And so people in Iran were able to read the news from around the world uh, by accessing it through Reader. And it made the, the censors decide, do we want to block everything Google? And for the most part, they didn't. They, uh, there, were, there was you know, one or two weeks where they did that. But for the most part, Reader was a way to access this news. And this is really important. In Iran, there's estimates that one in three news sites are blocked. So this was an easy way for people to get around that censorship. And you know now it's gone. Uh, so here's a quote that I really like from our friend Nicholas Weaver, uh, who I think sums this up really well. The only self-defense from all of these things above is universal encryption, which is difficult, expen uh, difficult and expensive, but unfortunately necessary. Um, so, and, and we know why it's necessary. There's another great advantage. If you run a new site and you uh, turn on HTTPS, uh, the ACLU's Chris Segoyan has offered a bottle of whiskey to any admin uh, at a news org that switches websites to HTTPS by default. So not only are you defending your reader's privacy and security, but also you can get a drink off Chris uh, off of it. So. I think Chris might be here right now, by the way. So you could even get it from him. Let's bankrupt him. Let's, <laughs> let's go nuts. <laughs> Okay, so this talk was actually meant to be uh, a really, a really optimistic, happy one, and I think it's going to end up being that way. But I, I think uh, because it's it's nice to be cautious. Part two is called "Not Everything Sucks Sometimes Probably." Yeah, and we'll see why not everything sucks sometimes probably. And um, so one way that we look at this, uh, at the way that things don't suck, is uh, through the Encrypt the Web report. 
And this is, it's, it's just a sampling. It's, you know, we look at a handful of websites, services that people use, and, uh, and we measure how, uh, how those sites are doing in, in terms of encrypting user data. And so uh, you can see the first category is, um, this is just, by the way, this is a long chart that I've just split up into two. Um, encrypts data center links, uh, which we saw matters because of the muscular attack. Supports HTTPS, and then the next two categories are how well are, are they doing HTTPS. Um, and then the last one is Start TLS for encrypting uh, user emails in transit, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And really the exciting thing here is that uh, we started with a lot of, a lot of uh, gray and red, and it's gotten over the, the last, we've been running it for about six or seven months, uh, it's gotten a lot more green. We've gotten a bunch of sites that have started uh, rolling out HTTPS and doing it well in perfect forward secrecy. And these things, you know, in response to the news cycle, in response to someone uh, pushing on them and saying, you know, your, your users deserve better. Um, one major example of this was Facebook in, uh, you probably can't see the date, but it's July 2013. So this is the month after the Snowden revelation started. Switched on HTTPS by default. It was, uh, most users had it before, but it's by default. And this is a huge amount of connections uh, that are now encrypted. Um, uh, we saw Google made an adjustment. Um, and HTTPS protects not just the contents of the page, but also if you go from an HTTPS site to an HTTP site, there's an extra measure of privacy added by uh, your browser will blank out the referrers. So the, in Search Engine Watch, they're just upset that they stopped getting uh, keyword data. but for users, that's actually an extra level of privacy. Oh, by the way, the timestamp on this is September 2013? Yeah, September 2013. Wow, so thank you, Snowden. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah. Snowden effect. Uh, so, um, so it's not just web browsing. So there's also email. And uh, email, SMTP, can optionally use uh, an encryption um, protocol called Start TLS, which is opportunistic. Um, which means like a server can advertise, I support encryption, um, and then um, the other side will upgrade to uh, TLS. But it's unauthenticated, and a man in the middle can downgrade by saying the side doesn't support TLS, and it'll just fall back to um, plain text because you really want your mail to be delivered, usually. Um, so uh, my colleague Peter made this awesome, although somewhat confusing looking chart from um, from Google's data. So I don't actually know why there's this like periodicity, um, but um, but on the whole, it looks like Start TLS usage is uh, is rising pretty well. So since December 2013, which is when this chart starts, um, there's been a 33 to 58 percent increase, and that's really uh, really great. Um, and this has been uh, similar statistics have been shown by Facebook's data. So you know, if you run a mail server, you can actually do an analysis like this yourself because you can look at the percentage of inbound and outbound um, connections that are using Start TLS. And if you find out, you should send it to EFF because this data is really hard to get. Like we can't just scan the web and like see um, like what mail servers are using That's inbound and outbound they do. Start TLS. <laughs> yeah. So it was really nice to get this data released by Google and Facebook, and we always like to hear more. Um, so after all of this, there was this report uh, recently from uh, from Wired, well, reported in Wired, that said encrypted web traffic more than doubles after NSA revelations. That's pretty dramatic. Um, but what did I actually mean by that? Next slide. Um, so if you read the report, it says that between uh, pre-Snowden and uh, after Snowden, the percentage of overall web traffic in each of these continents that is encrypted has gone from 2.29 to 3.8 percent in North America, which is pretty good. In Europe, it's gone from about 1.5 to 6 percent. But in Latin America, it's gone from 1.8 to 10.37 percent just in one year. That is, yeah, like that deserves applause. Yeah. I would, I would applaud for that. Um, um, and a lot of that is due to large service providers like Google and Facebook um, doing their part and starting to encrypt things by default. Um, but that is super, super significant. Um, so part three, what is next? Um, we've been doing really well, but you know, there's always things we can be doing better. And part three is supposed to be about 
um, you know, so you're, you're at Hope, you're probably going to go to a lot of talks that are really pessimistic, like, like whistleblowers are all going to die soon. That's what Hope's all about, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, they I... put Hope in the name because it's not in any of the talks. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I, so this is day one, um, and it's, it's nice to start on kind of a high note. So, um, part, right, so... So whatever you hear in the rest of the hope, remember that Cloudflare is pledging the double SSL usage on the web in 2014. Um, Cloudflare, I believe, is getting uh, is man in the middling about 5% um, of web traffic right now. So doubling that is going to be really, really important. And moreover, if Cloudflare does this, perhaps we can get Alchemy to do the same and say, Alchemy, you've been using your like excuses long enough. Look, Cloudflare is offering SSL to everyone, even free customers. Um, why aren't you going to do the same? And once we get CDNs on board, um, that will be really awesome. OK, uh, and then there's the browsers. So um, you know, there's this chart that I really like uh, about browsers <laughs> and what they're what they're like uh, yeah uh, sorry if you're in the back it's very funny <laughs> yeah I'm sorry if you can't read it <laughs> but it's really funny we'll tell you each individually <laughs> after. just come up after if you ask a question yeah, about go up what and we'll says, explain what the, we'll what the explain cartoon what is the cart <laughs> I'm sorry this is so small <laughs> I didn't realize this was going to be a large room yeah but um, so, how many of you know know about HSTS? Yeah, right. some of the fans, uh, I guess. I can't really see. Uh, <laughs> but HSTS it, uh, prevents against this attack called SSL strip, right? So usually you go to a website by typing in uh, gmail.com, and your your browser by default goes unless you're using HTTPS everywhere, which is this awesome browser extension. Um, but usually your browser will go to httpgmail.com. And if someone's um, actively monitoring your connection, they can take that and redirect it to a fake site, and you won't notice that the lock icon is missing, perhaps. So HSTS is a header that the server sends to the client that says, I only want you to contact me over HTTPS for the next several months, or however long the server wants you to do that. Um, and so that prevents against this SSL stripping attack, right? Um, and it's been around for a few years. Um, Chrome and Firefox have supported it. Safari, Safari also has for a while. Um, and now, IE, after uh, EFF asked them, uh, Microsoft has said that they're, they're going to support HSTS in the next release of Internet Explorer. Browsers. Yay, browsers. <laughs> browsers. <laughs> Cool. Um, yeah, and uh, and also uh, we've seen large companies like Yahoo say pretty awesome things, like pretty large promises. And it's up to everyone here to remember that people like people like Yahoo have said this and hold them to it because this is how we get things done, right? So they've said that traffic moving between Yahoo data centers is going to be fully encrypted as of well. Okay, so that's in the past. It's already fully encrypted. Um, they made Yahoo Mail more secure, HTTPS by default. Um, search queries will also have HTTPS by default. Um, and uh, uh, at the last one is kind of interesting. It says there will be a new encrypted version of Yahoo Messenger um, that will be deployed in the coming months. So great. Um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about an initiative that we worked on in this. This is actually uh, the the members of, of a coalition that, that worked on a, a campaign called Reset the Net. As you can see, it's a, it was a pretty large and diverse coalition. Um, and Reset the Net launched on June 5th, 2014. It was the one year anniversary of the, of the Snowden leaks. Um, and uh, it really showed how far we've come in that year. And it's, a, it's an ongoing campaign to try to uh, increase the, the security across these major platforms. Um, many of the sites listed here made improvements. Uh, perhaps one of the most exciting was um, WordPress.com announced that uh, they, by the end of this year, they will serve pages only over SSL for all uh, WordPress.com subdomains, and so that's that's you know a lot of blogs. As you can, this is our um, our attempt at an SSL added here, smiley face. Uh, 
So, and, you know, WordPress powers uh, between .com and .org powers fifteen percent of the web. So this is a this is a really major thing, um, and and we're seeing this, and we're seeing it more and more. Uh, and and of course, there are some other exciting things that don't have that aren't easily illustrated. Uh, yeah. So to be honest, I made most of these slides at four a.m. this morning, um, and I just don't have time to like find pictures. Though I'm sure some can exist. Um, so. Uh, so this is kind of a slide about what's new in SSL land, other than people deploying it. Like, how is SSL inherently going to get better? Um, so people yell a lot about SSL. They say that, you know, you can't trust certificate authorities, right? Like, if NSA can go to DigiCert and say, issue, a cert, issue me a cert for Google, um, then it's game over, right? They can decrypt all the traffic, et cetera. So how are we going to prevent things like that? Um, it's not impossible, it turns out. So there's a new proposal called Certificate Transparency that will basically make every certificate issued by a CA um, have to be added to a log uh, that is uh, maintained by Google and other organizations, like possibly EFF will run one of these logs. And for the browser to accept the cert, it has to accept, it has to, um, the server has to show proof that the cert has made it into one of these logs. And it uses like a cool data structure called a Merkle tree that makes this lookup process very efficient. Yes, people really like Merkle trees. I heard someone <laughs> really, really get excited at that. Um, so, so you know, what's certificate transparency at the end of the day, what it means is that if a CA issues a bad certificate, um, we can either, see, either we can see it or uh, in the certificate log or the client won't accept it. And that's really, really nice. Um, and Google is actually, like, you might say, oh, this is like some theoretical math thing. It's like not going to be used anytime soon. Um, Google is actually planning to require um, certificate transparency for all extended validation certs by the end of the year, if I remember correctly. Um, I'm not sure if that timeline has changed, but I think that's what they said a few months ago. And then there's HTTP public key pinning, which solves the problem that um, anyone can issue a cert for EFF dot or any CA can issue a cert for a site like EFF dot org. And HTTP public key pinning lets EFF say, "I only want the cert from uh, Start SSL, and this is the cert that you should expect to see every time you connect to EFF dot org." And that will make it harder for people to create fake certificates for EFF or Google and so forth. Um, HTTP public key pinning is, um, is I think you can already do it statically through a preloaded list in Chrome, and soon you'll be able to do it dynamically by sending a header like HSTS. Um, and on the mail on the uh, mail encryption side, EFF has just launched a project called Start TLS Everywhere. Uh, some of the creators of that are in the audience. Um, you can't see them though because it's really dark. But Start TLS Everywhere um, so tries to solve the problem of downgrade attacks on SMTP servers. Um, the problem is SMTP servers don't know each other's TLS policies. So if you say, um, like, mx.gmail.com doesn't support TLS, uh, be, like, if you say that from a man in the middle, then the other server has no way of knowing that's a man in the middle. So Start TLS uses these configuration files to enforce TLS policies between SMTP servers. Um, and we'll, we'll be giving more talks on that in the future, so I won't, won't tell you everything about it right now. Uh, no spoilers. Some, yeah, no spoilers. Uh, and um, so I heard earlier, earlier someone at Hope said, like I just overheard someone say, oh, like, you know, like sysadmins are never all going to deploy TLS by default. It needs to just be enforced. Like the default just needs to be encryption. We can't make people have to like buy cert and set it up and all this work. So HTTP 2.0 has a proposal to address that called opportunistic encryption, which will make all uh, what HTTP traffic encrypted by default. But then you might say, oh, like what about CAs? Like how do we get authentication? Um, and the answer is like opportunistic um, encryption might just mean unauthenticated encryption, um, which means, of course, that like NSA can just pretend to be any server and like do do uh, like a attack or a downgrade attack. So real TLS, is, real HTTPS is still better, but opportunistic encryption is on the table for HTTP 2.0. All right, so, uh, sorry, we, we put these comics up and then you have to read it, and I didn't say anything funny. Um, 
So uh, I hope that we uh, we effectively made the point today that um, HTTP is uh, is horribly insecure, and that uh, if you're running a website, it's not uh, it's not optional. It's it's for your for your readers and users. Uh, privacy and security and for your site to be accessible and to, to preserve the integrity, HTTPS is something that you should absolutely be uh, looking into and deploying. Um, you, you know, as we like to say, uh, if it's it's too important to, to leave up to an unencrypted protocol, so if, if you like it, you should put an S on it. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> Jan dared me to do that one. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, and we uh, thank you very much, and we'd like to open the floor to questions. Yeah, I'm sorry this talk was too short. We didn't really time it, so it's, it's half an hour. You can get a snack or something. But we we can also take questions for a bit. If people have those. Whoa! Wow, hey, most of you still here. here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. No. I can't hear you. You can, can we get the um, the question mic on? Uh, if you yell it at me, I will repeat it. Okay, so speaking is one of the authors of HTTP. <laughs> I'll repeat at the end. <laughs> it's not the people's mic here. <laughs> All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt to repeat as much of that as I can. Uh, <laughs> we inadvertently threatened to kill this man's baby. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I actually, we didn't threaten. We just said it has to die. It wasn't. Uh, and and the, the problem, uh, per, the, per the question or the statement, is better addressed at the CDN level and, most importantly, uh, that the CDNs need to hear demand from pe from their customers, which are you know likely uh, include people in this room, uh, that they want to turn on encryption uh, you know across the network. Is that? Yeah. And uh, and so I agree at least with the conclusion and probably with most of it, right? Yeah. Um, that uh, we ought to uh, we ought to be demanding this. That's how we get we get companies to to start doing those changes. Um, could you talk a bit about Dane? because you didn't list Dane in your promising. Uh, do you know what it is? Yes. OK. Uh, I think uh, we can talk more about that afterward. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of, um, so I'm not an expert on DNSSEC, but we've heard a lot of people say that it's infeasible for them to deploy at the moment, um, which is part of why we, um, we started the TL, Start TLS Everywhere project. OK, but the argument that the CDNs have for not being able to manage their certificates, if they could use self-signed certificates in their own DNS zone data, then that would circumvent that problem completely. And moreover, it would circumvent the problem with the crappy, you know, everywhere trusted CAs in every government in the world that you don't want to be able to issue your certs. So it would actually eliminate a lot of the pinning and transparency problems. 
if Dane were widely adopted. So I urge you to follow the Dane um, uh, efforts because I think they're going to be very promising. Yeah, there are a number of, uh, Dane is, is one of them, there are a number of, of efforts uh, that uh, have at varying degrees of, of technical completion um, that uh, have yet to be adopted. Um, and yeah, the, many of them are really interesting. Uh, a little bit of, of what we're talking about is what we have now. And uh, I, you know, we could, we could easily double the number of um, HTTPS. I mean, Cloudflare is talking about doubling it just with a switch on their end. And that would, uh, that does a lot of on the ground already. Huh. Ah. I guess. Oh. Is there any truth to the rumor that uh, EFF is going to fight untrustworthy CAs by becoming a trustworthy CA? Uh, that's a great question. I think we don't comment on rumors and speculation. I don't think we comment I... on that one. <laughs> well, think about it. But yeah, thank, thank you for asking. Uh, hi, my name is Richard Barnes, and I do security stuff with Mozilla. Um, Thank you. Which is relevant because I, I have uh, some bad news and some good news. Um, the, the bad news is that if Cloudflare is saying they're going to double the, the percentage of SSL on the internet, they're lying because it's impossible. Um, and I say it's impossible. The good news is that it's impossible because I, I was just checking the stats from our, our telemetry, uh, and we're seeing like 60% of the web being encrypted right now. So I think that's largely due to a lot of the efforts of the folks in this room. And so I wanted to applaud that part of it. Um, say, say again? You are counting differently from the way they are. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. I I, say, I, I'm having fun with metrics here. I say There's let's let them try. <laughs> let's take them oh, yeah, 120 percent encryption. We're happy. <laughs> we're happy. That's all we ask for. Yeah. That's so, all. We're, we're simple. So one of the things that was on your slides that's in active flux right now, really active discussion right now, is this idea of opportunistic encryption yes. in HTTP2. And I, I'm one of the, the instigators of that in the, in the HTTP BIS working group. Um, so if people could take a look at that, that's something where we have community discussions. It's in the IETF. There's a working group around this right now that's discussing it. So if people have a feelings about whether we should allow opportunistic encryption, whether we should require browsers to validate certs in HTTP2, mm -hmm. that would be something where community feedback would be really helpful. Uh, I also think this mail encryption you guys are getting involved in is, is really good. The, the web is sort of on a really positive path, and there's good momentum. The mail community, they're much more fractured. They don't really know how to do authentication. So whatever you guys can do to help move them forward would be really helpful. Cool, thanks. Uh, out of curiosity, do you, do you want to offer your opinion on opportunistic encryption? So the, those of us who have been sort of our internal security mafia at Mozilla have been talking a lot about this. Um, yeah. You know, we are uh, obviously HTTPS is the gold standard, as you guys said. Um, it's it provides all of, it blocks a, a whole another. You know, it is a standard. Um, Some color. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, it it blocks a lot of attacks that we know happen as you put on your slide. Um, we've been really supportive of opportunistic encryption. We we were um, in the IETF process. We've been putting forward proposals to enable uh, encryption with the, with the possibility of discovering when, um, you know, with the possibility for, as you said, unauthenticated. So um, spin up your Apache instance, have a gen genuine FSL signed certificate. Don't bother going out to, see, to, to a CA if you don't want to. Um, and we'll go ahead and do the encryption. And you know, we're not, we might not display a lock icon or anything, because it's, you're still vulnerable to all this stuff, because it's not HTTPS. But we may uh, go ahead and accept that cert and do the encrypted connection, uh, even if it's um, even if it's not a cert from a CA that validates an identity. Um, and I don't want this to turn into a Mozilla question hour. Um, so I I can't speak off the top of my head to the development plans in terms of what we're planning to implement. But in the IETF and the standards discussions, we've been trying to find ways that we can agree on uh, to to expand the set of website operators who can do encryption. Thank you. And I, I, I encourage people to take part in those discussions because they're interesting and I think it's a, it, there are some hard questions and, raised. And there's lots of different valid perspectives. So if, I mean, the, the more mass we can have behind different perspectives, the more we can understand how much the community feels one way or the other. Thank you. Um. So after Heartbleed, OpenSSL was a media darling for a little while and got some security reviews. 
Um, and like a couple more flaws have, float, have floated around. But in general, it's maybe in a better, one could argue that it's in a better place. However, there's also forks of it now, like Libra SSL and Google has their own deployment strategy for SSL now. Boring guys, SSL. Yep, what do you guys make of that? Probably good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's nice to have some diversity out there. Uh, it's also nice to have, I think, uh, if, if you don't have diversity, it's nice to have a lot of effort in one place. And uh, what, uh, what the, the media reports after Heartbleed showed is that we had neither. We had one solution that had you know, one and a half people working on it. Um, two, sorry, two and a half. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, I, I think that if, if what we get is more attention on OpenSSL or if, or if what we get is a, a number of, of really good solutions, then either way is, is, is better off. And you know, it's, it's easy to, Heartbleed was, uh, it was a rough week. Um, I work at Red Hat, it was a rough week. It sucked. <laughs> but but I, I think uh, it's, you know, we were able to recover and we at least have some sort of infrastructure in place for communicating that this happens and it came, I mean, there, it could have been worse and I think that there are things that, steps we took after that that, that will make it more likely to be better. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, uh, one thing, all right, one thing I've been thinking of, and this is something I've actually been thinking of for a while in regards to dealing with the problems of both CAs and DNS, is I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Namecoin project, but the possibility of using multiple Namecoin server, basically multiple Tor in services, as essentially Namecoin blockchain CAs, connecting to them through Tor, and then using something similar to Moxie Marlin Spikes convergence as a means of validating the entries when you receive them and then just transfer everything over to that rather than going through standard CAs and DNS. Yeah. And it's so simple. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, so there, there, uh, I've, I've seen a um, uh, number of proposals like that, usually involving some sort of like cryptographically verified append-only log, like a blockchain. Um, but I think, uh, if, if, I think we've yet to see something that's really complete along those lines. Um, and if that comes along, I think it'd be interesting to think about. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'd love if something like really weird happened. Like, it, I, you know, that's that's not even that that's pretty weird. But like, yeah, let's try a bunch of stuff and and see. You know, like, I it it could happen. And and uh, there's been a lot of stories about the development of the web where it wasn't. You know, it was pretty weird along the way. Just remember, science isn't about why; it's about why not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Thanks for the talk, guys. Um, Question, so SSL, yay. Buying an EV cert for 500 bucks, not yay. Um, so I do some work with like nonprofits and NG in NGOs. $500 you know, is trivial to a large corporation, but to some of these smaller orgs, that's, that's serious money. Or you know, some you know, activist blogger in Nepal. Are there any CAs that offer you know, free certs, <laughs> or would such a thing be feasible? Yes, uh, so it depends. So if, you're used, if you just have like a single page website, or I think just like a single domain website, and you don't need like arbitrary subdomain coverage for right. SSL, uh, start, Startcom will give you a free certificate. And, uh, but not EV, right, not EV, mm -hmm. that's correct. Uh, and uh, so Cloudflare has stated that they are planning to offer SSL to free customers to in the near future. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that's a really important point, though, is that uh, this is this is really important, and that's a good reason to tr to try to make it to to make these prices come down. And then that's that's a, a little bit of pressure, and and you know hopefully Cloudflare switching it on it applies more pressure, but. Yeah, it, that's obviously a burden, and there's, there's things that not just the cost. Um, if you're an activist blogger in Nepal, uh, it, it very well the complexity of, of deploying it might be a, a showstopper. And so, you know, there's a lot of places to work on making this easier. Thank you. All right, I think that's all the questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all. This is great.
Yes, 
Um, just a few brief announcements before we move on to our next presentation. Um, one of them is if you uh, want to hang stuff up around the conference, um, we're all for that. We love that. But um, be sure to use the blue painter's tape. Don't use any other kind of tape 
no matter how much you may want to. Um, if you need some painter's tape, go to our info desk or, or uh, security desk, and they'll have some, and they'll just give it to you because they like you that much. But uh, don't use any other tape than the blue painter's tape to stick anything to this hotel's walls. Um, beyond that, uh, I think, uh, I think we're about ready. If uh, These rooms have been filling up, so be advised that throughout the conference, if, uh, if a talk fills up and you leave before the end of the talk, you probably won't be able to get back in because uh, you've, lost your, you've lost your place. Um, all right, so without, uh, without further ado, it's uh, my pleasure to present the Internet Society Speaks. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Pesner and David Solomonoff. Thank you, thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. And, uh, extremely bright lights. Uh, so, not that I can see any of you, but I'd like to take a quick poll before we begin. How many of you would say that you are involved in internet governance issues? All right, I can see briefly like two or three hands. How many of you have um, called your congressman or so got, otherwise gotten involved in the net neutrality debates? All right, I got news for you. You're involved in internet governance. And as we, get through, as we go through this presentation, you're going to see why. But for right now, let's get started with the history of internet governance. We're going to go all the way from the very beginning, all the way to the possible and zany futures. So, <clears throat> so let's talk about how the internet actually began. This began in the mind of J.C.R. Licklider when he envisioned the intergalactic network that was going to link all the computers in the world together, of which there were maybe on the order of 10 to 20. So. You can imagine, why would we need to link these things together? And, you know, these days it sounds like a foregone conclusion, but think about what computers were like then. These were giant information processing machines. You fed data into them, and you got data back out of them. You know, there was no questions of using them to learn, th to uh, really research things, or to um, find, novel discuss you know, find novel discoveries beyond what you were already doing with your data. They were just giant, room-sized, bulky items. And now this guy wanted to link them together for some reason. Now, J.C.R. Licklider only had a small two-year tenure at ARPA, where he was, uh, but he wasn't able to get it off the ground at that point. So his Robert Taylor, his protege, was the one who actually did it. And Leonard Kleinrock at UCLA hosted one of the first nodes. Kleinrock was found a, had published research in the packet switching technique that we all lo know and love today. And his grad students, Vince Cerf, Steve Crocker, and John Postel, ended up forming something called the Network Working Group to elicit and to discuss new ideas for this emerging ARPA network. And they sought requests for comments, or RFC, on ARPANET's development. Now, the cool thing about the network working group was that anyone could participate. Of course, when we're talking about a network of four nodes, that's not really a whole lot of people. But the good news is that as we got more nodes, we got more people. And since the object of the group was to talk about the network, it was sort of a self-propagating and beneficial feedback loop. People, anybody who wanted to get involved was really able to, and there was no question of exclusion or backlash as long as you were able to play nice with other people. And because people were collaborating and working together, they were able to develop a lot of uh, <coughs> foundational protocols and software that are foundation to the internet today, such as email. That was a combination of the already existing FTP protocol plus some messaging systems uh, customized for different nodes in the network. So, as the ARPANET continued to develop, people realized that this packet switching network thing was actually a pretty cool idea. And they started, others started to prop it up. We had the Aloha Net, and in the 80s, the NSF Net, and a few other networks. BBN was trying to establish its own network. I think IBM was as well. So before we know it, we had dozens of, or maybe not dozens, but a whole bunch of different packet switching networks. The problem is they all work differently. The ARPANET had these interface messaging protocols that sort of governed how traffic was directed, but others worked differently. And it was just, these were all kind of on their own networks. These were railroads with no interconnection. And so Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn developed the Transmission Control Protocol, and literally they called it Transmission Control Protocol slash Internet Protocol, the idea being that they could use this protocol to internetwork the networks. It didn't matter what kind of data you were sending. TCP IP was just focused on getting the data from one place to the other. Then the networks could do with it as they wanted to. They could insert their own protocols closer to the endpoints. 
What was cool about the TCP IP protocol is that it was open source, or what we know today as open source, because they just shot it out to the network working group and said, here, look at this thing. What do you think of it? And then they were able to take it and improve upon it and eventually implement it on the emerging popular Unix system in the late, not in the late 80s. This is how Sun computers became very popular, because you could include TCP IP at no extra cost. Again, seems a given today, but at that point, it was most definitely not. So now we get to network privatization. As I said, there were all these different networks. And so TCP IP kind of made it as a um, kind of you know, glued all these things together, but it was a rickety operation at best. And not only that, these networks were used primarily for academic or extremely geeky purposes. Uh, the idea of the average user having anything to do with the internet was still uh, nowhere on the table. But then a little something called the World Wide Web came around, and people started to take notice. Suddenly, there was human readable text yet you could change the fonts and style of this was amazing uh, the ideas of having graphics graphical user interfaces for the web you know this was this was big stuff in the late 80s and early 90s and so people started to realize hey maybe this network this internet could actually be useful for uh, the general public people like you and me and so expansion started to they wanted to expand it but the internet but the internet and its relevant smaller networks were being run by academic institutions and the NSF and other organizations that really had no business in trying to service a network for the general public. So they saw privatization as the means to go, uh, as the way to go. Telecoms like AT&T could suddenly take this over and add you know, this new internet to their already existing copper telephone lines. And this is how we had our little fun known as dial-up. So, so that's how the network started to become accessible to the average person in the early 90s. But there was another aspect to this, and this is where the whole governance thing starts to come in. Uh, we may know, you know, for, as you know, the Internet's inventor, Al Gore, uh, became vice president in the uh, early 90s. And he had been working on technology issues for a couple of decades prior. And once he was in the vice presidency, he was really able to make this a central component of the administration. And he, um, <clears throat> he came up with this term, the, the information superhighway is the one that stuck. But for policy purposes, this was all referred to as the national information infrastructure, this emerging technological network that was going to better the lives of everyone around them. So they set up some information infrastructure task forces to discuss some of these technology policy issues that they could foresee arising as this internet became common. Now, for those of you who are curious about the 1996 Telecom Act, too bad. This is uh, occurring in a different sort of space than what I'm about to talk about and was really more centered at the FCC. I'm about to talk about stuff that was more focused at the White House and Department of Commerce. So, but before I get to that, um, one thing I want to mention is that this was not simply an American initiative. A lot of this was happening in the American White House, but they recognized that this was going to be a global phenomenon. So. So many of the people involved were not only just working here, but they were going to meetings abroad. They were trying to talk about how can we connect to users abroad, users in Europe, users in Asia, users in Africa. These were questions even then, even before the internet was uh, as prevalent, anywhere near as prevalent as it is today. And they strove for you know, generally uh, admirable goals, universal access and open competition, and different uh, settings that could make the internet easily usable and accessible by anyone. Now, e-commerce was actually a pretty big topic that got a lot of attention, particularly when we're talking about international commerce. Now, buying stuff on the web, oh, big deal today, right? But, of course, it, we're talking about a network that in the late 80s was used strictly for research purposes and, in fact, was forbidden from having any commercial content posted to it. Think about that. Think about trying to talk about e-commerce on a network with that kind of history. And not only that, Try to talk, try to think about e-commerce between nations which have vastly different tax laws different, and different other sorts of uh, regulations when we're talking about trying to buy and sell things. This is huge. And security, mobile payment, I mean, we're talking about big, we're talking about issues that people are still grappling with today at a time before the internet was in everyone's homes. So, but it was a good thing to be able to put on the internet as people uh, started using it because people want to buy things. And so, um, so lots of people were had their different opinions on it, but the, it really started to make headway when Clinton, the Clinton administration, set up its own little interagency uh, group among the different government agencies to talk about this. Uh, but they really couldn't ever figure out a governance solution, and I haven't done much research on the modern uh, issues of e-commerce, but I think they're still trying to figure it out. 
So now we have to talk to the question, get back to the question of who was actually at the table for these things. There are all these committees and all these discussions, that gr that's great. But as I was mentioning, so far it was really mostly from the government. And so the Department of Commerce established committees for several key issues, apart from the ones I already mentioned, including intellectual property and online privacy and government information. Those, those uh, committees each published very key reports. And, um, but the reports had differing levels of effects. The privacy paper was really sort of my talk about loose, like, well, you know, you should, if you're a company using personal information, you should probably tell your users what they're using it for. Simple, right? And, but the IP, uh, Intellectual Property Committee, was a whole different story. They published very strict and specific recommendations in favor of copyright holders. Their logic was, well, the internet is here, but we've got to fill it with content. And unless content providers are confident that their content is secure, they won't be putting their content onto the internet. It seems kind of logical, but then they kind of missed the step where users generate content themselves. And this whole new type of idea of information sharing that has uh, arisen since then. So there was a lot of internet outrage and, and coordination, even in the 90s, around uh, issues like these. There was uh, particularly around universities and libraries and other types of uh, digital, digital uh, eggheads who kind of saw these, in, these IP laws as, as threatening to them. They really uh, were concerned that if these recommendations worded as specifically as they were were put into place, you know, all of a sudden the internet might you know, turn into a place that was a little less desirable for them to be, for them to be working. And uh, this is without the benefit of hindsight that we have today. Um, there, were other, there, was other, um, uh, there was another organization called the Advisory Council, separate from the committees that I just talked about. Now, this was interesting because these were compri this was comprised of people from outside government. Everything else I was talking about to this point was made up of people already inside government, a federal government. But this council included people from education, included people from uh, universities, from research, from telecom companies, from technology, from big media, et cetera, et cetera. So we were talking about a, a council that was at 1.37 people strong from all these different areas. Now, you might imagine that having all these people in the same room was great. We got all sorts of debate going on and all sorts of uh, ideas being exchanged, but then it kind of comes hard to come to consensus. If this committee with all these different people is expected to publish something, well, what exactly can you expect them to publish? The result were these was this, these sets of reports that were very broad and high level in terms of what they discussed. You know, we want to talk about educating users on these capabilities. We want to talk about getting internet into hands of people. We want to talk about people being secure in their information, but also information being able to be used for uh, opportunities like commerce, and we want property be to be protected. Nothing that really sounds terribly objectionable, but it was very broad and high level and it represented really the base uh, agreement of what the such a diverse group of people were able to come to. Uh, now, as I mentioned, we had that thing with the IP committee and their very specific rules. There was also the Communications Decency Act uh, proposed by Senator James Exxon. It, that would have um, made it illegal to show any uh, obscene content to a minor up through the internet. Now, uh, imagine trying to enforce that without severely crippling the internet as we know it. And in fact, um, aside from the public outrage that it provoked, um, it was declared unconstitutional the very year after it was implemented based on uh, free speech issues. Uh, but the question is that, you know, the people who were from outside government who were involved, they had different levels of impact because some were, you know, people, the general public who were involved were pretty far back. They were you pretty, some, some of them were very aware of what was going on. Some of them were very much less aware. Remember, we didn't have the internet to easily keep track of these things. So people had to do a lot more work to figure out what the status of these issues were and to even organize any types of protests or write a letter or anything like that. And then we had this council that was a little closer to the, to the action because they had this formal affiliation with the IITF. But again, they were sort of one member among many uh, who were all together trying to find the consensus of where people from all these different directions were coming from. And that seems like it'd be a little straining. So that was basically the policy that was happening. Oh, and before I forget, what actually happened with all this IP controversy? Well, there was this, this, this big back and forth. It actually took years of debate between the IP committee and the uh, groups of academics 
and um, <clears throat> the groups of academics and universities and uh, other libraries and other folks who found it objectionable. But eventually there was sort of stuck through the back door and a little international treaty provision and a, a lot of the usual politicking you might expect. And eventually we ended up with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which has caused no controversy since then. So, sorry, now we can go to the Internet Society. And if you've been wondering since the beginning exactly what that is, wait no longer. It was founded by Surf and Khan in 1992 with the belief that the Internet is for everyone. You know, this is, a, again, a pretty big change from the research network of just the decade prior. Um, and they recognized that as this network became more prominent, there were going to be issues that developed, uh, very key social and policy issues that developed, uh, that it was that something like this really needed to be around to address. Uh, its initial uh, its initial uh, focus was to really sort of help the internet's technical development through something called the Internet Engineering Task Force, which really focuses on sort of protocol and packet engineering. But as it's developed, it's got this outreach. It's got pillars from outreach, technology, and policy. So today, the Internet Society actually has its hands in all sorts of internet-related activities, from you know comments on policies like SOPA to sponsoring international internet organizations like the Internet Governance Forum to uh, even management of the .org domain system. So the Internet Society really represents one of the first attempts, one of the first efforts to get more people involved, people who weren't interested, who weren't already in policy or government or had any reason already to know much about what was going on with this thing. Today it has about a hundred chapters throughout the world, including one right here in New York, to address the concerns of its local members. And another key organization that was founded in the late 90s was the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. It was basic, it's, this is what is in charge of managing the domain name systems, IP allocations, and protocol port numbers. This was a job that used to be handled by John Postel, but unfortunately um, he, uh, he left, he, he, was, he died in the mid 90s. So uh, they decided that uh, he was such a powerhouse that they need an entire corporation to do his job. Since then, uh, there have been some long-standing concerns over ICANN's transparency and the fact that it was established by, a U by the U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce as opposed to an international organization. This is what le this has led many people who are uh, from outside the U.S. involved in internet governance to basically say that the U.S. controls the internet, which I think is a you know a little reductionist. But it did remain a uh, long-standing issue. Now, for those of you in the know, you might be aware that ICANN has recently announced it's ending the contract with Commerce and it tends to move into an international body, but exactly how that's going to happen is yet we're, we're not really sure. Um, and also, if you've heard something about the global top-level domain, that's ICANN's doing as well. And finally, this also, these organizations like ICANN and ISOG really point to something called the multi-stakeholder model. Now, what is that? This is a change from, for those of you who are not political scientists, I'll fill you in, uh, the traditional means of diplomacy and governance and um, policy agreements uh, on a global scale was done through multilateralism. This is uh, comprised of established states and diplomats and uh, transnational corporations. We're talking about people on you know, these types of scales here which seemed appropriate before we had something like the internet. Uh, it was difficult to ha synthesize information about what was going on and we as a people couldn't really communicate our, um, our interests and our ideas so effectively to, people, to uh, the government. So we kind of needed them to do a lot of this for us. But as the internet came into being, we had this multi-stakeholder model which seeks to bring every stakeholder in. That means if you are a user or otherwise involved with the internet in every way, you have a stake. But exactly how are we going to do that? And to this day, there isn't really a clear definition of what the multi-stakeholder model actually is or how it works. This graphic that I've got here is actually the, clo the only version, the closest thing I've found to any sort of definition of a multi-stakeholder model, any sort of clear definition. But even then, that leaves a lot of room for interpretation. And you can start to see how the history has led to a very open questions of internet governance that have, um, and that's why we see a lot of debates today over issues like SOPA and Snowden and other issues in the internet where a lot of things really haven't been settled or defined all that much because they weren't defined back then either. But we do see how a lot of the discussions today mirror some discussions that were happening years and years ago as well. 
So the internet is a very young medium still, especially when it comes to its time in, um, in the public forum. And in terms of uh, understanding how it's going to be governed and used, it it's very much remains an open question. It's not a utility that we can come to expect like u electricity or running water. And uh, many people do tend to think that way. But it is still something that has become enormous, inordinately central to a lot of what people do, a lot of what people in this room do. And it would be a mistake to not be aware of these key governance issues. So I'm going to let Dave, I'm going to stop it here and uh, let David Solomonoff here take over and bring us into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Here we go. Oh, you can? Oh, this is good. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so to pick up the uh, thread there with the multi-stakeholderism, uh, the current debate uh, in terms of things like ICANN, a lot has to do with the degree to which um, uh, whether nation states uh, alone or large multinational corporations and uh, owners of media companies and that type of thing should have the primary role in internet governance, whether NGOs, civil society should have a role and what that role should be. But this is kind of misleading because it, now that effectively almost everyone uses the internet, everyone is a stakeholder. So the real uh, challenge, I believe, and uh, we're working on this particularly with the Internet Society of New York, is to educate more people about internet governance because there are lots of people who are, say, politically active in other ways in their local communities, that even at the federal, the you know, state or national level involved with politics, who don't understand anything about uh, or even know, even if they use the internet, that there is such a thing as internet governance. Um, so I'm going to jump to the next uh, level here. Uh, we've got we've figured out who the real stakeholders are, and now let's uh, take go to an, another level and. Um, the motto of the Internet Society is the Internet is for everyone. Uh, the founder, Vince Cerf, also likes, has been involved with the different initiatives in terms of things like the Internet of Things. So he likes the Internet is for everything. Um, so, but now like we're going to uh, take a quick look here at um, the bigger question of uh, who is everybody and what is everything and uh, where is the Internet, uh, you know, where is cyberspace going? So uh, in terms of uh, basic you know, users of the Internet, the new users are coming from developing countries. And typically, the uh, mobile, like a smartphone or a tablet, is their primary uh, means of access. Um, the ongoing problem with new, adopt, uh, you know, new users of the Internet tends to be that over time, they are technically less sophisticated. At the same time, cheaper, more powerful hardware becomes available. And in the case of um, mobile devices, uh, I'm, most people here, I'm sure, are very pro-open source and the open source model. But uh, as you know, things like tablets and mobile phones tend to be more locked down, more proprietary software. It's harder to install open source software on them. And um, of course, as we probably many people here are aware, the open source model is a better security model and not a perfect one, but it allows for better auditing of, of uh, security problems. So we're kind of moving in an area where we can expect more security issues uh, at the end user level for uh, with new, new, uh, new internet users. Uh, we also see the same problem uh, in terms of the IoT, as it's known, the Internet of Things. A recent Wired article I just read the other day uh, covered, uh, had a, uh, a uh, situation with uh, hotel rooms where they had a wired, uh, were using a wired communication, uh, a communication protocol that was intended for wired communication, so, which is, so security is pretty simple there. Uh, but they adapt, it was used for, uh, uh, you know, guests at the hotel, at hotels to turn on the lights and the air conditioner with a, a, a with an iPad. But they adapted that wired communication pro protocol that had no security. I put that on a wireless network because it was just the easy thing to do. And so, of course, that meant that if you're a, a, you know, a malicious hacker, you could turn off uh, somebody else's air conditioning on a hot day and that type of thing. So we may be seeing a more incidents of that as there's a push to uh, take things in the same way in the early days of the web. Uh, there were, you know, um, this, the 
corporate mainframe was put online sometimes uh, for say uh, for comic you know e-commerce without proper consideration of security we may be seeing uh, a lot of incidents in the world of the internet of things with devices you know embedded devices sensors and such where there are security problems um, the we're looking at a point where the uh, Internet of Things and you know wireless wireless connected devices like sensors and the like are going to be the use are going to be expanding massively because um, of a couple of trends here. You've probably most people here have heard of Moore's law that uh, every uh, 18 months uh, a, a new computer chip has got double the density in terms of transistors on it. Uh, there's also something called Kumi's law uh, that st uh, is similar for actual. Uh, energy efficiency in uh, electronics. So that is to say that, uh, you know, the actual um, the power that's needed to, uh, to do, operate a, a certain type of computer with a certain capacity is dropping massively. And what that means is that uh, there's an interest, Charlie Strauss, a futurist and sci-fi author, uh, had a, recently had an interesting blog post where he speculates that uh, by t uh, 2030 that a, a city would be able to uh, cover every square meter of the of the city with sensors or embedded devices uh, that would be f quite powerful for the, co the cost of currently what, what it costs them to clean the streets. So uh, that you know naturally this this is a lot of data and uh, there's major kinds of privacy issues there. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know it cuts two ways. Uh, lots if you know general purpose computers become tiny and ubiquitous, uh, we can also have cool things like this, which. Uh, Okay, let's see, go here. Uh, okay, right. Okay, all right. So, oops, whoa. Okay, sorry, folks. Uh, okay, yeah, that, yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, can we page down here? Okay, so uh, this is a Raspberry Pi that's been uh, set up specifically to be used as a Tor router. Uh, and it's pretty inexpensive. It's, this is from the Adafruit website, and it's uh, like $100. $100. Uh, so you can imagine that in a few years that it would be possible to take make lots of these uh, incredibly tiny, incredibly cheap, and distribute them uh, throughout, say, an urban area. So at one time, on one hand, you have problems with surveillance that becomes ubiquitous, but at the same time, you have the ability to uh, route around damage and censorship and the like in a way that it's never been possible before. OK. Yeah. All oh, right, there we go. Back to okay. So right, okay. So uh, now, uh, what else? Uh, how else will the internet change? Well, okay. Vince Cerf, uh, it, it, one, another one, pet project of his is the interplanetary internet, and um, that actually is uh, not an attempt to communicate with space aliens. We'll maybe get to that later, but. Uh, it's basically a, a, a way to adapt the internet protocol for the long distances and interruptions of uh, space travel, but also has other kinds of interesting applications because it's basically delay tolerant networking where interruptions and, and problems of that type uh, can be worked around the way the current internet protocol ca uh, cannot be. So uh, it could also be used in a situation where there is uh, some kind of major um, you know, natural disaster breakdown of uh, telecommunications infrastructure. Uh, the interplanetary internet protocol could uh, handle that better. Uh, could, you know, it could also be used in some cases where a repressive government interrupted uh, telecommunications services. And another, a third application that's being looked at a lot is the use of scientific and environmental research in very, um, very remote places where there isn't normal uh, infrastructure as well. So if you're studying wildlife. Uh, migration in a distant area, you could use something, you could use the interplanetary internet protocol to more effectively, you know, put sensors in, in that place and, and, and collect the, the data from them. Another uh, cool thing that Vince Cerf and musician Peter Gabriel have started uh, is the interspecies internet. Uh, so again, our definition of a multi-stakeholder is expanding quite a bit. The interspecies internet is an attempt to communicate with intelligent uh, cr uh, creatures that are not human, like dolphins and such, uh, using uh, different kinds of uh, uh, digital interfaces to teaching them to, for example, to you know having a really waterproof, of course, <laughs> a large tablet computer which a dolphin might learn to you know bump with uh, different uh, sections of the screen, the touch screen with his nose, and and uh, learn to communicate that way. So obviously, down the road we may be looking at uh, some very different kinds of stakeholders in the internet. Another more bizarre and slightly disturbing uh, trend is the use of uh, military applications for animals that involve um, 
uh, different kinds of implants and, and the like. Uh, one particularly bizarre one is uh, DARPA's HIMEMS, that's an acronym, uh, project, which stands for Hybrid Insect Microelectrical Mechanical Systems. And what they were doing there, and I have, uh, as of about 2011, I couldn't find anything more up to date on this, but it, it was a long-term project for about six or seven years. They were embedding electronic devices into insect larvae, so that as the insect uh, came, you know, to be an adult insect, uh, uh, that it, they would be actually be able to control the insect's movements with the idea of make basically, as bizarre as it may sound, making cyborg insect warriors. The idea is initially that they would fly around and could do reconnaissance, but I suppose uh, if you've got a really, you know, venomous uh, insect uh, with, you know, you could use it as an assassin too. But again, the point is here that, um, you know, basically anything electronic now is likely to be connected and often wirelessly to the internet. So, you know, uh, the, um, the cyborg insect warriors are also stakeholders in the internet, potentially. Um, to move uh, to, now we're going to go uh, reverse direction here. So now we're talking about who's coming online. Now we're going to talk, I'm going to move to our jumping a little bit further into cyberspace uh, with virtual worlds and augmented reality. And uh, virtual worlds are taking off uh, at a rapid pa uh, pace now uh, in things like online, immersive online games and the like. Uh, and you may think if you're not a, a gamer or, you know, into th such things that uh, it still seems that the inter the resolution and the actual quality of, of the environment, the experience is very poor uh, and that it, you can't imagine people really living in a cyberspace quite yet. But the brain is hardwired to respond to two things uh, without questioning whether they're very much whether they're real or not. And one is uh, threatening uh, you know, stimuli. So if you're threatened, you don't worry uh, too much or question too much if something's real because you don't want it to hurt you. Conversely, if something pleasurable, why, why, why worry if it's pleasurable or whether it's real or not either? So, for example, a really sophisticated, well-designed game might switch, uh, you know, rapidly between threatening and pleasurably, pleasurable stimuli to the degree that it becomes very immersive, even if, again, the resolution of, say, an online game, the, the imagery is not really uh, ultra-high resolution or realistic, you can become very, very absorbed in it. Um, and uh, we're all, at the same time, we're moving uh, towards uh, the increasing use of currently for uh, medical and military applications, things like uh, impl uh, implants for people who are hard of hearing, that are network connected, uh, bionic eyes for, or implants, the optic nerves for people who are blind or have uh, visual problems. But obviously these types of things can be used just as a general purpose uh, in, in, you know, uh, replacement for uh, the current monitors that we have. So uh, basically we're, we're looking at a situation where the sense of self will be changing rapidly if you're ha you have this stimuli that's coming from cyberspace or somewhere else feeding into your, directly into your brain, um, your sense of what your body is and, and your sense of self that way will change very rapidly. Um, and also what we're seeing is a shifting sense of uh, self and loyalty to institutions that's changing, partly because of, you know, things like uh, younger people feeling uh, alienated, um, having economic difficulties and so forth. One study found that people's um, life satisfaction with their lives uh, in uh, the real world was kind of inverse to their uh, satisfaction in their, on say, if they do, you know, do a lot of things in Second Life or what have you. Their Second Life existence, if that was very uh, positive and they were very happy, it was probably because their, li right, real, their physical life in the physical world in me space was not as good. So uh, we're seeing uh, with people who are be uh, younger people who are, you know, uh, being due to economic disparity and other kinds of issues, alienated from uh, political and economic systems in the real world, moving rapidly to uh, spending more and more time in virtual worlds. Uh, the other interesting thing there is that uh, this is a fairly recent study, but uh, a couple of years ago, that uh, at that point uh, the user users of of online games and, and uh, virtual worlds typically had four avatars. So we're for now uh, each stakeholder has now been multiplied by four. We have four uh, people, for, uh, uh, online per uh, personalities for every every person. So things are changing that way. Um, and these are the uh, growing presence of people, or the, the movement of people into virtual worlds uh, and uh, online games and the, that virtual environment has a, presents a lot of interesting challenges to the traditional nation state. So um, the, uh, you know, basically the, the concept of, uh, I'm, 
citing Mark Goodman, who is a uh, law enforcement consultant who specializes in cybercrime and cyber terrorism and information warfare. Uh, and he talks about how the concept of virtual reality is pretty new to law enforcement agencies around the world, yet uh, more and more people are spending more and more of their time in the virtual worlds, and the full range of criminal activities that we see in the real world is rapidly migrating to uh, to cyberspace uh, in terms of, specifically in terms of virtual worlds where things like uh, money laundering, uh, theft of intellectual property, exchange of child abuse images, and uh, the like are occurring without, uh, you know, the same kind of awareness in terms of law enforcement. Currently, vir uh, most vir uh, virtual worlds are uh, kind of siloed uh, environments, uh, uh, like a, a company like Second Life uses as proprietary software, a very centralized uh, kind of architecture. But that's changing too. Uh, a person you've never heard, you, everyone here has heard of Tim Berners-Lee and knows that he invented the World Wide Web. Uh, another person uh, is probably, uh, I think, in a few years will be seen as, as important as, as Tim, uh, and her name is Christina Vidira Lopez, uh, a computer scientist based out of the uh, University of California. In 2009, she developed the Hypergrid, and that's an open source uh, technology for uh, doing what, in virtual worlds, what the web does for uh, the internet, so that is, it makes uh, interoperable virtual worlds, so you can go from one, your avatar can go from one world to another. And this opens things up radically, but it also presents interesting uh, problems in terms of uh, intellectual property and uh, that type of thing. What can you take from one world to the next? Some kinds of issues, much more complex, but similar to ones that have been have mostly been dealt with in the web a long time ago. Uh, in, ter in addition, there's now an open metaverse currency that allows transactions across vir these different virtual worlds, and they can be converted to uh, regular uh, currencies, bitcoins and do U.S. dollars and that type of thing. So uh, I was talking a moment, ago, a moment ago about the change of, of uh, sense of self and identity uh, that people experience uh, or, you know, through things like uh, immersive uh, technologies, uh, virtual worlds, and also implants. Um, and these present a lot of interesting uh, questions here, too. DARPA is currently working on mood altering implants to help people with uh, post-stress uh, traumatic uh, PSTD. Uh, so they are looking to be able to alter people's uh, moods with brain implants, which of course will be uh, connected to wirelessly, most likely, as uh, increasingly medical prostheses are. Um, and uh, who else is going to be on the internet? Well, uh, you think of yourself, we've already determined that uh, people are becoming several people in terms of different personalities on the, the uh, in cyberspace with their different avatars. But uh, it gets a little stranger here. Uh, DARPA also is working on a type of uh, uh, sensors that will uh, recognize a, un uh, a rat, your Basically, when you're experiencing a, a threatening situation, you sense it unconsciously more quickly than you respond consciously. So uh, to speed things up in the battlefield, they're looking to develop uh, different kinds of monitors that will recognize the unconscious reaction to a perceived threat and allow a soldier to, or have, have, help a soldier by having his uh, the uh, electronic uh, gun sight on his weapon start to look for the target before he's even aware that uh, he's uh, he or she has uh, identified a threat. So basically, the unconscious mind is going to have its own, uh, you know, input on the internet, separate, and this one uh, could be obviously developed into other kinds of applications and a different sort of uh, thing where you can uh, uh, maybe deny that you uh, did something because my unconscious did it, but it wasn't me. Uh, in any event, um, obviously, the, these kinds of uh, more in, in invasive uh, types of interfaces uh, present major kinds of security issues that haven't been, again, uh, the technology is running ahead of uh, where security is being, uh, you know, so, and it might be bad if somebody, you know, breaks into your bank account and steals money, but if they start, you know, controlling your arms and legs and your uh, impressions of the world, that, that's a little scarier. Uh, and so uh, there is a reaction to all of this, so that, uh, and of course, more mundane kinds of security issues we've seen, been all, all of very, very aware recently, like the Snowden revelations, and uh, a bit of a reaction to it, so that both the Kremlin and the German government, for example, are reverting to paper and manual typewriters uh, for critical sec high security um, communications uh, in their organizations. Uh, in 
a favorite sci-fi author, a visionary sci-fi author of mine, Philip Dick, uh, wrote a, no a novel many years ago called Ubik, which described a uh, part of the story involves a prudence organization, which employed people uh, with uh, sort of inverted kind of psychic abilities. Not that they weren't psychic, but they were able to block other people's psychic abilities because uh, telepathy was being used in industrial espionage. So if you you're, you're had a company that where you were concerned about another company might spy on you, you'd hire an a anti-telepath to accompany you uh, when you, you went into a, a conference and you were going to discuss some sensitive stuff. So uh, where this all is kind of grim and scary stuff. Uh, and um, basically we need, it, it comes back I think in the end to um, the fact that uh, in the end human beings develop technology even if we make if the technology then can you know promulgate itself and uh, ultimately uh, what has to be built into the technology uh, is uh, an ethical sense and as machines become more intelligent uh, we need to do that even more so. Uh, Eben Moglen, who is a friend of the Internet Society of New York, uh, a, a so, uh, important uh, software freedom advocate and uh, done, did a lot of legal work for the Free Software Foundation as well as teaching at Columbia, uh, warned specifically about uh, mobile devices uh, that knew too much and whose inner, inner workings were not understood. Uh, and he uh, su suggested that uh, there be a, basically, um, that the ethics, some kind of ethical behavior be programmed, hardwired into uh, intelligent machines. And he was kind of thinking a little bit of, uh, you know, Isaac Asimov's iRobot, of course. Um, there's now a really pretty cool uh, organization called the uh, Open Robo Ethics Initiative, uh, which is a think tank that's addressing issues of, uh, you know, uh, ethics as a pertain to robotics and taking, trying to take an open source approach to it, uh, looking to the development models of uh, Wikipedia and Linux too. Uh, the final um, question here, I guess, and this gets back to the issues of uh, uh, a little bit of internet governance. Uh, the real question is whether a human community can get to the internet engineering task force credo of uh, rough code and uh, consensus, uh, whether, uh, Rough, right, right. rough consensus and running code, I, I knew it was something like that, uh, whether the, before the machines uh, can go on to their, uh, uh, you know, act out on the worst impulses of human beings and, and then ultimately on to their own, own, unknown agenda before we can stop it. So, thank you. Thank you very much. I bet you weren't planning to hear about cyborg insect warriors today. All right, so um, I think we'll start to take questions now. We might want to turn up the house lights a second. There we go. Thanks. There you all are. All right, so if anyone has any questions, uh, we'd be happy to field them. Oh, yes, and how could I forget? It's on. Question slide indicates it's question time. Uh, I have a question more about the uh, the sort of mechanics of the Internet Society and ICANN and such as it currently exists. Um, you'd mentioned I, I'm familiar with the ICANN, like trying to distance itself from being a, a U.S. Uh, what's the uh, run by the Commerce Department? Yeah, the, the Commerce Department. Uh, is there any discussion of like moving it underneath the Internet Society or having its own sure. being its own thing or? Um, the Internet Society is taking more of a role in ICANN uh, recently, so that we uh, we have people who are on the uh, different kinds of committees and oversight organizations for ICANN. Also, uh, and this is a, a good thing, and this is why you should join the Internet Society and get involved with your local chapter. Uh, the yeah, here this is the, the sales pitch. Uh, there are there are like caucuses uh, within ICANN. They're called at-large structures, and uh, in the past, a few Internet uh, society chapters were at large structures, including uh, ours, the New York one. But that's changed radically so that now about 50% of the at large structures are um, actually Internet Society chapters. So uh, the Internet Society is taking more of an active role. They're not going to take over or control ICANN, but uh, have a, a growing role in, in terms of advocacy and are really work, uh, very much working, pushing for greater accountability and transparency. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin Karen. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. And full disclosure, I'm more of a political activist than I am a, a tech person. So 
uh, bear with me. But um, one of the issues that I work on in Atlanta is the issue of autonomous weapons that's coming up uh, more recently. Um, there's going to be some more work done on this in the international community coming up here. And I talked to Mark Gabrud, who's a, a scientist. He suggested a ban on autonomous weapons in 1988. I'm curious, like, where you see this going and, and kind of what needs to be done. There's a researcher in Atlanta who's working on it right now, and the DOD wants him to do it. So I'm just curious in your thoughts on that. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll let David. I'll just, I'll just start by saying that I think a total outright ban or total outright support of anything is uh, is an oversimplification. I mean, because as with any software or technological item, an autonomous weapon system is made up of different parts. I mean, really, it's the weapon parts that's that's dangerous. The autonomous part, maybe not so. You take away the rocket, there's not really much of a threat. So. I think that, you know, so the question is, would we ban this technology, maybe ban, you know, the use of the rocket, or I think, I think that in order to answer that question fully, we'd have to break it down. Start. Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, there was a DOD directive that kind of defines what the U.S. is, is calling autonomous yeah. weapons, so right. that's kind of where my head's yeah. at, but. Right, there are uh, autonomous weapons now in place in certain parts of the, parts of the world, like uh, the um, DMZ in Korea, mm -hmm. they have, on both sides have autonomous weapons there. Uh, they're fixed, you know, basically the guns with a, a computer uh, that will I identify a target and shoot at it. Um, uh, a while ago, I was at a, a, the uh, Drones and aerial, aerial Robotics Conference, which was, I think, down in the, at the uh, New York Law School. Uh, and Daniel Suarez, who is a, uh, a sci-fi author with a military background, uh, gave a great, fantastic talk. He just wrote a novel about the subject. Uh, specifically about um, uh, both aut autonomous weapons and uh, autonomous weapons that could uh, um, uh, join uh, swarms or active groups uh, independently uh, on, a, on an ad hoc kind of basis. Um, and what he thought, uh, suggested is that uh, all drones have a cryptographic si uh, signature hardwired into the, you know, the main uh, circuit board of, of the device uh, that could, would always identify themselves. And that any kind of drone that did not have this could imme would immediately be assumed to be hostile and, and, and destroyed. Um, so that that would basically be, the, it, through this digital fin fingerprint, it would be possible to uh, identify them. And so that was his uh, you know, technical solution to it. Thanks. Great talk. Sure. Thanks. Yes, definitely great talk. Thanks very much. Um, David, you mentioned, uh, you talked briefly about ambient connectivity, so Bob Frankston's idea. And uh, for myself, I think that's, that's really essential for an open, mm -hmm. pervasive right, Internet right. of Things and the community right. of the future. Uh, yeah. In the previous talks, we talked a lot about ISPs, Comcast being everywhere, and all this incentive to, to, to block something like ambient connectivity. Right. I'd be curious how you see it possibly playing out, the challenges. And right. Uh, I think it's a real cool idea. I'm not quite sure how it exactly would be implemented. But to pick it up and just to clarify ambient uh, connectivity, Bob Frankston uh, invented the original uh, spreadsheet, VisiCalc, and, but now he's a uh, smart guy going to other things and is pushing this idea of ambient con connectivity that basically uh, in the same way that we don't, you know, take uh, streets and sidewalks for 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 granted, that uh, connectivity to the internet should be as accessible as that. And his idea is that uh, rather than breaking down the silos between different kinds of services, so that, for example, uh, you might walk down the this street here, and uh, if you were to take out your smartphone, you would see that there are many, many different Wi-Fi you know, hotspots and things like that, but that they're, they're lock, locked down. And basically, there's a lot of redundancy there. We talk about a bandwidth shortage, but actually, there's a huge amount of bandwidth that's not really available. So that basically, if you could do something along the lines of mesh networking across topologies and networks and provide all, make all of that connectivity available to anybody who needed it, you know, with some kinds of restrictions, that that would be a, a good thing. That's his model. And uh, the business side of that, or the political side, I'm not quite sure what the solution is. It's a very cool idea, though. In order to probably fully implement a vision like that, I don't know if TCPIP can take us all the way there. Uh, there are talks on emerging internet architectures, which probably we should have talked about a bit. But uh, one, you know, specific type of content delivery networks. You know, this is often used as an example as Netflix. You know, uh, rather than trying to, if you're if you're trying to watch Netflix and it's a busy time of day, you know, you shouldn't just you know request the main Netflix server. You know, people, you know, there should be content servers that can provision the content closer to where it actually needs to be. And if we stop talking about IP addresses and start breaking down internet content in terms of what it actually is, then we can start 
start to uh, get to where we're trying to go a lot quicker and ambient connectivity becomes a lot more possible in that kind of context. Awesome. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Hi. First off, uh, thanks for your talk. It was fascinating. Um, my question is, I think the Internet's one of its greatest strengths has been its lack of regulation, its lack of any of these um, current political structures that we have in, in most other areas of life, and it's allowed a great amount of flexibility. Is that something that we really want to be aiming to, to have more of in the future, or is the current chaotic architecture actually like a great strength and something we should strive to keep? Uh, I'm sorry, the current what architecture? Uh, cha chaotic architecture. Oh, chaotic? Um, yeah, we want to, uh, the design of the internet, um, uh, in terms of being kind of permissionless, in terms of your being able to um, offer new surveys uh, on your own server and so forth, that is very important. And uh, certainly uh, something that we, at the Internet Society, and particularly of New York, Internet Society of New York, but want everyone to be a first-class citizen on the Internet. That is to say, you know, a lot of times if you have residential broadband service, it's really designed for you to be a passive consumer. It's asymmetrical. You can't upload as much as you download, and you, know, you may not be allowed to have servers in your home. Uh, according to the you know uh, AUP acceptable use policy or whatever, and no, we're we're very much for just a, a, a decentralized model and uh, things like mesh networks and outside of security and other kinds of real law enforcement kinds of issues that are you know legitimate um, that people should be able to do what they want. That's very much what we're about, and and, and including uh, independent you know uh, community networks and that type of thing. We're very much for that. Sure, thanks. You talked a little bit about um, the uh, robots becoming autonomous and doing whatever they're wanting with their nefarious. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on uh, the Kurzweil thing and the uh, exponential increase of technology and the singularity, how that we're... Well, I have an opinion about that. Yeah, you, that I mean, yeah, yeah. 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 Right. I'd like to hear your opinion. Yeah, I just uh, saw uh, him give a talk uh, the other day. Um, my, I have a couple of thoughts. One, uh, I, you know, I'm a technologist. I, uh, I believe that there is something beyond uh, our current technology in terms of the human spirit and consciousness and such. Uh, and I think that uh, I don't think that uh, machines are intelligent in the way that humans are, or living beings are, uh, and that the type of intelligence that we have is radically different. I think the biggest thing to do is to understand what how our current technology is really different, uh, even if it's supposedly intelligent, how it's different from human or, or uh, you know organic sentient uh, uh, consciousness and uh, to understand some of the, the ethical and moral issues there. I think that's very important. Um, I, I, you know, uh, probably, uh, I'm not, my crystal ball is a little cloudy here, probably Moore's law is going to continue more or less, and, and Kumi's law and the like, and so that uh, the current kinds of technolog uh, technology are going to get more powerful. But I don't really know that they are the same as uh, or organic uh, technology, uh, you know, technology of our brains, or the ineffable uh, you know, thing of consciousness, which may be something very, very different. And uh, you know, I, I'm a spiritual person. I believe that there is something outside of the material. That's my opinion. Um, and uh, that that we're not going to duplicate that with the current technology ever. It's gonna, and if we ever got close, it would be because it really changed a lot. It was very different from this. Could you comment? Oh. I'm pretty much in a, a agreement with him in the sense that. Um, you know, we understand. I mean, we understand, understand that even today's top artificial intelligence isn't really intelligent. Most art of many, the artificial intelligence is designed to do a particular problem. It's designed to be really good at jeopardy. It's designed to traverse a lot of terrain. It's designed to make autonomous decisions about where to go. What the beauty of you know, I guess human and animal intelligence is, is that it's dynamic. It can learn new things without really being programmed to do so. You know, it's, it's extremely inventive. We have an understanding of aesthetic and beauty, and um, my timer's getting close, so I'm going to oh, cut it there. Thank you. But thank you. No problem. Yeah, last question. Uh, thank you. It was a very, uh, very nice comprehensive introduction to the Internet governance issue. I just wanted to comment quickly that what you mentioned about the multi-stakeholder mod model, uh, that please do not uh, make the mistake to consider multi-stakeholder more as a problem of, of uh, representation, because the old na national governance model in the world, it was based on the, of the uh, concept of representation, structural representations, and the whole idea of multi-stakeholder mo model tries to break up, break up that idea of representation. 
and b instead build up uh, freedom and liberties for for people in a deliberate uh, democratic sense to open up and raise their own issues. So oh, I'm not like when I say we couldn't define it. I'm not trying to put it down. I mean, absolutely. I think the multi stakeholder model has done well wonders for the internet society. The problem is, is that when we try and talk about what is it, point to it, how does it work, how do we manage it. That those become trickier questions, but in terms of which internet governance model is best, I think certainly the Internet Society believes that the multi-stakeholder model is the way to go. That just doesn't mean we can't, you know, yeah, we may yeah, just yeah. be able to tell you exactly what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, everyone.
Hello again, Hope. Good evening, everyone. Um, just a couple of brief announcements before the next presentation. Um, if you, uh, through the course of this conference, go to a talk that's, uh, that gets filled to capacity, as has happened already a few times today, um, please note that if you leave before the end of the talk, we can't uh, always guarantee you'll be let back in because bodies move into spaces where bodies once were and your body may no, may no longer uh, have a space. Um, if you uh, want to hang any posters or anything like that up around the conference, that's, uh, that's cool. We're all for it. But uh, please do not use anything but the blue painter's tape. Uh, we'll give you some. We have some at our uh, security desks, I believe. Um, or if you have your own, just uh, make sure it's the blue tape. That's the only tape that's allowed to be stuck to the walls of this hotel. And uh, I, think, uh, I think we're about ready. If, uh, so without uh, further ado, I'm happy to pronounce. Uh, I'm happy to pronounce. <laughs> I'm very. Ha I'm happy to pronounce things. Um, I'm happy to present the uh, the next presentation, which is why the future is open wireless. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Adi Kamdar, Nate Cardozo, and Ranga Krishnan. Thank you. Hello. Can you all hear me? Great. Uh, how's it going? How's everybody doing? It's been a long day. Had enough club mate? Yeah. Um, because I clearly haven't. Um, the, we're here to talk to you guys about open wireless, about the open wireless movement. Um, open wireless is a project that we, uh, we're all from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, that we've been working on for the last few years. And uh, it's, it's getting better and better as you know, the days go on. Um, so uh, just by way of introduction, I'm Adi Kamdar. I'm an activist at EFF. Can you go down? Sure. Uh, I'm Nate Cardozo. I'm one of the staff attorneys at EFF, and one of the thing, one of the several things that I work on is the Coders Rights Project. So I defend uh, hackers, coders, innovators, programmers, uh, try and keep you guys out of trouble, and try and help you get out of trouble when you get in it. And that's part of what I'm on this panel for. I, and uh, is it working? I don't think so. Yeah, so uh, and I'm uh, Ranga Krishnan. I'm a technology fellow at the EFF, and uh, I actually joined uh, just last year uh, to work specifically on this project. And it, it has been uh, very exciting, and I hope to show where we are with it today. Um, so the Open Wireless Project um, it, it has a lot of roots, um, but but one of the one of the um, issues that this is trying to solve is one that we may have all experienced, that I definitely experienced. Um, in fact, th the other day I was at home and uh, my internet went out and I, I checked the available networks and there were, there were 15 networks. Um, and uh, most of them were locked. Um, and I couldn't access anything, um, which was unfortunate. Um, uh, and uh, I did see one unlocked network and it was called Big Blue House Guest. Um, and I knew exactly which house this was on my street. Um, and I'm like, great, you guys are, are going to allow me to use your, uh, your internet. Thank you, friendly neighbors. Um, un unfortunately, I ran into this uh, right afterwards, a nice uh, captive portal. Um, and it says, you know, enter the guest account password, um, which I didn't know. And I didn't really want to go over and knock on the door and ask for the password. Um, this is the sort of issue where, uh, you know, we're living in a world where walking down the street, sitting at home, in the office, whatever, we have a bunch of uh, wireless networks available, um, yet none of them are actually accessible. Um, and uh, it, that it seems inefficient to us. Um, there's another story from around a couple years ago when um, we were launching this project um, where um, uh, Hurricane Sandy happened. Um, how many of you guys are from around here? Um, I can't see anything, so I'm assuming there's some hands up. Uh, <laughs> I realized that was useless. Um, well, uh, uh, I'm sorry you guys had to experience Hurricane Sandy because uh, it, it seemed awful. But um, uh, the one of the things that came out of that is with the power outages and with the outages of service, um, uh, we saw things like this. Uh, this was a friend who tweeted this out. Um, awesome picture of internet infrastructure, New Yorkers idling for free working Wi-Fi outside of Starbucks. Um, and this is actually right around the corner. Um, the, Starbucks was one of the few places that was offering free Wi-Fi that was working and that people could actually access. And you know, these were people who uh, needed to get in contact with people, um, needed to check their email, needed to send out, um, you know, I'm okay, I don't know, Twitter updates. 
Um, th these were people who needed to use the internet, and yet they couldn't. Um, and uh, the one place that was oper offering um, uh, some sort of uh, open Wi-Fi, some sort of free Wi-Fi, was um, Starbucks. Uh, so uh, with this in mind, we we started the open wireless movement. And um, the point of the open wireless movement is to encourage um, open wireless, is to, is to create a world where open wireless is the norm. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're imagining a world, uh, a future with ubiquitous open internet. Um, why would you do this? Why would you open up your wireless networks? Um, uh, it's a good question. Um, uh, part of it could be because of sharing. Um, sharing is actually a very important thing. Um, you know, not all of us are using all of our bandwidth all the time. Not all of us are using our networks all the time. Uh, we've been in situations where we needed to get on the internet um, and we couldn't. And it would be nice if someone shared their internet with us. Um, uh, we, uh, EFF actually has a board member, uh, Bruce Schneier, who, um, who runs an open wireless network. And it says, it, I like his quote a lot. It, he says, to me, it's basic politeness to run an open wireless network. Um, Providing internet access to guests is kind of like providing heat and electricity or a hot cup of tea, and, and who doesn't like that? Um, but besides access, um, why open wireless? Um, access can't be the only issue. There are a lot of uh, um, groups and, and people advocating for access to the internet, um, and that's, that's an issue that a lot of people are dealing with right now, um, and open wireless by no means is the be-all, end-all of this, but um, it is a step in the right direction. Um, one of the big reasons is, is privacy. Um, now, how can, how can opening up your network be conducive to privacy? And this is something we're actually gonna talk about quite a bit from a, from a legal perspective and a technical perspective. Um, but um, one reason is because right now when we're mobile, right now when we're, when we're roving around, um, we're tied to these things. We're tied to our smartphones. Um, and um, uh, when we wanna access the data, when we wanna access the internet. And um, these smartphones use um, networks offered by folks like these. Um, um, and that's kind of an issue, right? If, if we wanna be mobile, if we wanna use um, devices, if we wanna connect to the internet and we're not close to a, a, a wireless network that we have access to, um, we have to pay a contract. We have to use these sorts of services. Um, and our smartphones are, are essentially tracking devices. Um, so wouldn't it be nice if, if um, you know, the, the privacy world we imagine actually fostered uh, uh, the sort of innovation that we're, we're, we're seeking. Um, if it actually fostered innovation that didn't have to rely on these few big players and could actually take advantage of all of these wireless networks um, running through us right now. Um, and, and this could be any sort of innovation. Here are four random pictures I found. Um, if you wanna connect your dog, if you want to uh, uh, have a watch that does something smart, if you want a face mask, I'm not actually quite sure what that is, but it looked kind of cool. Um, uh, uh, and it could be connected to the wireless internet, and wouldn't that be great, uh, um, potentially? I don't know, but, but these are the sorts of innovations that uh, you can't necessarily use out in the open because uh, you, uh, you know, AT&T and Verizon and, and so um, have this sort of uh, domain covered. Um, one of the big questions that, that people ask is, all right, fine, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe okay with opening up my wireless internet. I may be okay with opening up even a part of it. Um, uh, but doesn't, this, doesn't opening up my wireless network just reward freeloaders? Um, can't people just get on and um, do whatever they want with it and not pay for anything? And doesn't that suck? Um, and, and our answer is no. Um, uh, you know, it, this is the sort of world that we want to live in. We're trying to imagine a future where uh, having that sort of uh, culture of sharing um, and having that sort of culture of openness is something that we can um, actually foster and actually uh, go towards. Um, so we're trying to fight against this mentality that this is, uh, this is a bad thing, that this is my wireless internet, I need to lock it down and have it be mine, mine, mine. Um, because uh, we think with sharing, with open wireless, um, it's sort of a rising tides um, effect and everybody, everybody just benefits. Um, so with that, we're gonna get into uh, the fun legal matters. That's me. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm, is this on, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, as I said earlier, I'm Nate Cardozo, I'm a staff attorney at EFF. 
Uh, and one of the things I do is uh, counsel the Open Wireless Project. I also do coders' rights. So now is my, my quick little lawyer stuff disclaimer. I am a lawyer. Um, I'm not your lawyer. And nothing I say will change that. Uh, unless you're already one of my clients, in which case I'm not talking to you right now. Um, so I will not be giving legal advice today. If you come up uh, to the microphone after we're done talking, which we will invite you to do, and you ask a question that calls for legal advice, this is not a confidential setting, so I can't give it to you in this setting. Uh, I will give you my card, and we can talk about it later uh, in a confidential setting. But this isn't one of those. OK. Copyright. There are several, and I'm, I'm going to address sort of three, sort of a little more than three sets of reasons uh, why open wireless isn't a bad idea. Um, copyright is, is one of the objections that a lot of people have to open wireless. And, and what do I mean by that? If I, uh, if, if, if I torrent a, a whole ton of movies uh, without uh, using any sort of protection online, chances are I'm going to get a DMCA uh, notice or a six, six strikes notice or some sort of complaint, right? Um, if I don't do that and I open my, my wireless network to others, uh, is that a problem? Um, no, I don't think it is. Uh, and, and there's a number of reasons why, why that's the case. Uh, if you're not the person uh, doing bad stuff online, especially with copyright, uh, you're not going to be held responsible. Uh, in copyright, there are, there, there's one way that you can be held responsible if you're not the one doing the bad thing copyright infringement. Uh, and that's secondary liability. And that comes in two flavors, uh, contributory liability and vicarious liability. Uh, these are doctrines which uh, are extremely fuzzy and, and have a lot of ins and outs. But, but what we need to know about them for, for these purposes is that contributory liability uh, requires essentially that the network operator have knowledge of what's going on and caused or induced that behavior. Uh, and for vicarious liability, the network operator has to have the right and ability to control the copyright infringement going on and receive direct financial benefit uh, from the copyright infringement. Luckily, with open wireless, uh, th those factors are not satisfied for either contributory or vicarious liability. Uh, if, if I open the, the wireless network at my house, um, you know, I don't have actual knowledge that anyone is using it to, uh, to do copyright infringement unless they come tell me. Uh, and I'm certainly not inducing uh, them to do so. I'm not saying uh, this is, you know, unless I put a big sign up on, in front of my house, they connect to openwireless.org SSID and use it to torrent your movies. Uh, I'm not in inducing uh, copyright infringement. Uh, don't do that. That's a bad idea. Uh, vicarious liability is similarly the same. Uh, if, if I'm a neutral network operator, I don't have the right and ability to control what people are doing uh, on my network. Uh, and I'm not receiving a direct financial benefit from it either. Um, if you have an open wireless network at your house, uh, chances are you are not receiving a direct financial benefit from that. Um, but there's some other things that, that can help us out here too. And, and uh, this is one of the aspects of the DMCA which is not entirely bad. Uh, the DMCA, uh, and there's the code number, I, I was told that maybe if there are lawyers in the crowd they can get CLE credit for this, so that's why I actually included the case. I, I, there's some case titles later down uh, and, and the, the statute. So there's uh, Section 512 of the DMCA. Uh, creates a safe harbor for network providers. Uh, this is completely optional. Network providers do not have to take advantage of, of it if they don't want, but it's often a good idea, and we have a plan for how they can do this with open wireless. Um, we've crafted a sample policy. Uh, one of the requirements for the safe harbor, uh, if you want to take advantage of the DMCA safe harbor provision, uh, is that you have a policy, uh, a DMCA policy, uh, and we have a sample for you. And the policy says uh, that you know you can't use this for copyright infringement, uh, and that you the, the network operator will terminate repeat infringers. Uh, and the, the other part of the safe harbor is that it must accommodate rights holders technical measures. Uh, those technical measures must be jointly agreed upon. That's never happened, so we don't really have to worry about that. Um, so, safe harbor. You, uh, in order, oh, ooh, 512M, subsection M of section 512, says that the network provider does not need to affirmatively monitor the network to qualify for safe harbor. And that it even comes under the nice little subheading privacy. Uh, so, 
what is safe harbor in general? Uh, it is a way that will provide, it is a way to provide immunity to the network provider to DMCA uh, complaints. We think that the sample policy that we've crafted at openwireless.org uh, and running an open wireless network on, at home or at your small business, uh, and, and if you post this policy or if you refer to it, which we think we're doing by having your SSID say openwireless.org and the policy's right there at openwireless.org, um, there, there's a good argument, it is untested, uh, that that would qualify and you would not be liable uh, under the DMCA. Negligence. Some lawyers, uh, and I won't call them trolls, but they're trolls, uh, have, uh, have decided that the very act of running an open wireless network at your house is negligent. Luckily, they're wrong, and the two courts to have addressed it directly have told them that they're wrong uh, in very, very strong language. Uh, running an open wireless network is not negligence. Um, why? I mean, probably because that's what wireless was originally meant to do, right? It's not a breach of the duty of care if that's the standard, um, which is completely true. Risk. This is, uh, this, this is something, um, this is one of the more uh, strong objections to open wireless. It, when we uh, after Andy Greenberg's story on this project came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Reddit thread was dominated by people saying, if I run an open wireless network at my house, I'm going to get swatted, right? I'm going to get a SWAT team busting down my door uh, for people downloading child porn and doing whatever else bad people do on the internet. Um, that is not completely out of the question, however, a lot of people run open wireless today and it doesn't, the SWAT team scenario doesn't happen very often. Uh, and the more people who run open wireless, the less likely this is going to be. Um, so there's a little bit of a first mover problem, but luckily you're not going to be the first mover. The first mover was years and years ago. Um, if, you know, if you're running open wireless and a police comes to investigate and they see that you're running open wireless, you know, maybe that would help you out a little bit. Um, you know, sometimes police don't do that thorough of an investigation before they break down your door, so that's not a, uh, that's not surefire. But there are some other things we can do to, minim uh, to mitigate the risk here. Uh, and, and one of those things is in a future release of, uh, of the software that Ranga is going to talk about, uh, we're going to have the option of routing all of the uh, guest network traffic over a VPN of your choice or over Tor, um, and that will uh, not lead anyone back to your IP. Uh, obviously, this is, um, I'm not recommending that you do your child porn surfing uh, over Tor or a VPN. In fact, I recommend that you do not do that. Um, but hopefully most people don't, don't do really horrible things online. Um, I, you know, I've been running an open wireless network at my house for years and I've never been swatted, but you know, uh, I, I don't think I'm unique in that. So I think the risk, uh, it, the risk is there, but it is overstated. Um, there are some other things which I, I don't really have a slide for, which I, I do want to talk about. As Adi said, um, how does open wireless increase your privacy and the privacy of others? Uh, right now, there's a I wouldn't say it's a legal theory, but there's a sort of prevailing attitude that a, a person's identity can be determined simply by their IP address. Um, we think that's wrong. We think an IP address can sometimes be a proxy for identity, but often isn't. Uh, and that is absolutely not conclusive. And, and courts are starting to come around to this. Um, it's, it's been tested most often in the copyright troll situation. Um, where you know Malibu Media sues a 79-year-old grandmother for downloading unspeakable title, um, and the 79-year-old grandmother says, "Look, I wasn't the one who downloaded unspeakable title. Uh, it couldn't possibly have been me." And they say, "Well, you're the subscriber on the IP address," and she said, "Yeah, but that doesn't mean it was me." Um, so the more people who do open wireless, the harder it is going to be as a legal matter to claim that an IP address is your identity and that your identity is your IP address. Um, we, we don't think that's a good thing. Uh, secondly, uh, the sort of ubiquitous